Um, my research is a little bit tangential to Stuart's career, but uh, there, there have been, been lots of contacts, and so I want to say a little bit about the beginning, where there was some contact, and, and then also a little bit about the end. So the beginning is that we, were, we shared the same thesis advisor. I was in the Cummins group, but not when Stuart was there. He left in 72, and I was there from 75 to 81. Uh, and so uh, uh, Stuart uh, was uh, among the uh, cadre of former students uh, that uh, I learned about mostly uh, at the beginning through their PhD thesis. And in fact, I, I in, have known for the past uh, you know, approximately 40 years where that thesis is on my shelf, and so I brought it with me, but it, before I did that, I scanned in the cover. Um, and uh, uh, that thesis, in fact, informed me a lot about the style of physics that we were going to be engaged in here, uh, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about. But before I do, I want to point out a remarkable resemblance between Stuart Friedman and Paul Simon. Am I the only person <laughs> Who's ever ever realized that? Anyway, when I <laughs> when I when I first met Stuart, uh, either coming back from Princeton or Stanford, I'm I'm not sure which, uh, I, that just struck me and it stayed with me the whole time. So I thought, okay, I would share that with you. Anyway, this came from Stuart's thesis. It's been discussed a lot uh, today, uh, but um, uh, it's 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 our mind's eye. It's our view of what we what we're doing. And we, so when we try to honestly explain it to people in our thesis. We draw pictures like this, it's great. I mean, you know, an atom is this beautiful laboratory that has these energy levels that uh, we can uh, interrogate by the way they fluoresce and looking at the color of the fluorescence. We do that with these, with these beautiful streamlined, you know, it's just, you know, the light comes out, we send it through a polarizer that's, you know, as perfect as we can make it and collect it and do, and, and, then, and then when we compare to theory, you know, here's, Here's the, the uh, classical result. I'm sure this was, has been, been shown to you enough so that I don't have to describe in detail that uh, Stuart got a really good measurement that classical physics, or that I should say quantum mechanics was right in the classical physics that didn't uh, in, involve some of the ideas of, of uh, collapse uh, and, uh, and quantum measurement were not right. Uh, I read that, that was, you know, that sort of became part of what I thought I should be doing. Now, here's, of course, the reality. We were down there in the second basement of Burge in, uh, in, in an environment which was uh, in, in environmentally not all that uh, stable and, and temperature and so forth. And there was a lot of duct tape and there was a lot of, and everything was homemade. And we dealt with uh, either uh, cells or atomic beams that involved high temperatures and a lot of stuff that was probably uh, a little bit poisonous, maybe. And, uh, you know, somehow we lived, and, and all those, the other thing I wanted to point out about this is that this is this great picture that's been shown so much. It's in Stuart's thesis, so I could just scan it in. And, it, you know, there's, there's Stuart, and there's this sort of sublime solitude when you're in the laboratory that, you, you know, it's... Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're alone with your thoughts and your apparatus, and, and, and there's something just absolutely beautiful about that. Well, when I joined, the group was a little bit different already, had moved on. Uh, there were three members, Steve Chu, Ralph Conti, and Dave Neufer. Here's pictures of all three of those. I see Gene probably recognizes that era. Steve looks like he's, he's running things, and that's... <laughs> That's the, that's the mo I have a lot of photos from this era, but this one is so characteristic, I just thought I just had to use that one. In the background is Dave Neufer, our, our, our sleepy uh, theory grad student, and then uh, Ral Ralph Conti, and, and uh, the three of those folks were embarked on this uh, very exciting, uh, powerful uh, a series of experiments on parity violation that I gladly joined. In fact, Steve recruited me to come to Berkeley to join this experiment in a sense because I was looking around at schools and I, I walked into the machine shop at Berkeley as an undergrad at Harvard looking at schools and, and ran into Steve and he convinced me not only to come to Berkeley but to come to this experiment. And he told me that, you know, just, just do that. Gene might say, you know, maybe or, or wait, or, 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 but just do it. And he was so right. So I did that. Then uh, later, after I was there, more uh, students came along, Larry Hunter, Persis Drell, Carol Tanner, I also have 
photos of, 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 of the first two from, from that era, Carol. Uh, I didn't, couldn't find a photo of, so there's a much later photo of her. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, you can take away from this series is how close we, we were uh, to, uh, to, to Gene, not, not necessarily uh, always in the lab, although he was quite often in the lab in, in uh, my case, uh, but uh, sort of intellectually uh, interested and involved and, and uh, always filled with uh, ideas. Uh, now, here's uh, an example of those same sorts of pure thinking about um, how what we're really doing is looking at nature at its, at, at its most fundamental aspect. And I'm not going to go, since this, isn't, this, is, this is subsequent work, not Stewart's work, so I'm not going to go into detail about it. It's a measurement of electroweak interactions in atoms. But the, the, the point is that um, atoms provide such a pristine laboratory for studying the most fundamental symmetries of nature and all we need to do is look at them with light. And this is what Stuart, I think this is the tradition that Stuart really started in the, in, in the Cummins group. The Cummins group had done a lot of nuclear physics experiments but, and microwave experiments. This was a light experiment. And we continue to do light experiments with lasers. Now, as, <clears throat> as far as the apparatus goes, it uh, continued to be uh, messier and messier and dirtier, even though it looked pristine in the, in the figures. And also, we, 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 had this, we had this sort of tradition. You know, I talked to Steve a little bit, Steve Chu a little bit about this uh, earlier this week. And he, he pointed out that we were really poor by today's standards uh, of, of, of a laboratory doing this, this kind of work, doing work at this level. That, and, and you know, strictly speaking, that's true. That is, if you had more money, you might have done things differently. But it wasn't money that we thought was the coin of the realm here. It was care, and cleverness, patience, and, and, and precision. And uh, so it was OK that we built a lot of stuff. So here's some line drawings. We actually built our own dye lasers in the early days. Actually, you could buy dye lasers by this time, but we didn't. We built them. Steve Chu was a big innovator for that. And, uh, and we, we scrounged the parts and, and did it. Uh, we also. Uh, 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 probably did a lot of uh, environmental damage without realizing it at the time. Um, this is a great photograph of Gene in the lab. It's a very characteristic photo that he would just be sort of on the side uh, uh, performing some, some, some task to help the experiment get to work. Uh, but uh, what's also great about it is that large jug of, of uh, methyl alcohol that's uh, sitting there. We would go through one of those uh, every couple of days and it would all go into the sink, uh, unfortunately. I mean, we wouldn't do things that way. It's not that we were cavalier about the environment. It's that as a civilization, we were cavalier about the environment in those days, and not so much anymore. Uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's, that's how our work proceeded. Now, one of the great things about being in the Cummins group uh, is that we seemed to have the world's respect. It was, it was quite, quite remarkable. And so we would go to international meetings and be treated like an equal with some of these greats. And uh, I have this photo, which you can see was taken by such an amateur, it's cut off. It's the Cages workshop on uh, neutral weak interactions in atoms from 1979. Gene didn't go, but uh, uh, Ralph Conti and I went, and so many others. Stuart is there. Uh, let me blow it up here. You know, there's Stuart. There's, there's J.J. Sakurai. There's Eric Adelberger. Bill Williams, that's Valentin Telegdi. I think that's, I think that's Carl Wyman, because he was at the meeting and it doesn't look like him anymore. But that's Bell. I think that's John Bell. It's the only time I ever got to meet him, by the way. And um, is that Alan Espe? I'm not sure about that. But you know, Tim Chop was also at the meeting. I know he's here. Bob Dunford. Uh, People are, I, people are murmuring uh, faces that they recognize. I'm sure that you recognize faces that I, that I don't. But it was quite a remarkable meeting. Pat Sandars is there, Patrick Baird, uh, all of the people who uh, were involved in, in, I think Norval Fortson was there, but I didn't, didn't spot him. Uh, now, you know, these, these kinds of photographs would get completely lost if you didn't drag them out every 20 years or so. And so about 15 years ago was the last time 
that we all got together for the, uh, the, the uh, Cummins Fest. And um, you know, this was actually another one of my opportunities to reconnect with Stuart after quite a few years because I had not been working in a field that was close to where he was. Uh, but there has been much more recent opportunity, and this is how I, I, I want it to, to end. And this is one of the reasons that uh, I thought it, it might be interesting for, for this audience for, for, for me to say something about my view of Stuart's career, because um, Stuart, of course, uh, we all know he had a sense of humor, he was highly devoted to science. He didn't suffer fools gladly. Given that that's the case, why would he ever spend any time in Washington, you might ask. But, in fact, he, he cared very greatly about uh, the, uh, the, the, the health of nuclear physics in the, in the US and, 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 uh, and, and, and wanted to help promote it for the right reasons, that is, for fundamental science. So he chaired, uh, he, he and I served on the board on physics and astronomy for the last couple of years. And I got to interact with him several times a year because of that. And he, he also chaired uh, the... Uh, uh, nuclear Physics 2010, the Decadal Survey in Nuclear Physics that just uh, actually was published uh, earlier this year. And it was eventually, its publication date is 2013, but of course it was completed in the years before that. Now, uh, you know, this is a scholarly book in a sense. I mean, the, the, the agency, the people in the agencies who, who fund nuclear physics are very interested in this kind of book because it's authoritative and all. There, but there's another aspect to uh, the purpose of these books, and that's connecting with the, the broader Washington community that needs to make decisions about funding. And, 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 and these books don't quite do it as they stand. And so uh, what to do? It's something that the uh, National Academy and the Board on Physics and Astronomy wrings its hands about all the time. And Stewart's committee had a unique idea about that, uh, how many people have seen what I'm about to show? Yeah, a few. Not everybody. Not you. They, they produced a promotional video. And, that's, and, and you know, no problems with copyright, you folks over there. This is, you can freely download this. This is not part of what you have to pay 60 bucks to the uh, National Academy's press for. But, but pardon me? The reports are free now, that's true, if you, but only if you download them, not if you get the paper version. Anyway, enough, enough said about that. Let me play it for you because I think it's quite remarkable. From phenomena occurring in the depths of space and time to the structure and behavior of the tiniest particles that compose everything we see, the scope of nuclear physics is vast. Discoveries in nuclear physics point us to a fundamental understanding of our world. Its science explores the conditions prevailing at the beginning of the universe, as well as the building blocks of the elements around us and of which we're made. At the same time, the technology of nuclear physics improves our quality of life through advances in medicine, materials, and security, and along the way, fuels economic progress. Its story is one of discovery and innovation, occurring while in pursuit of the heart of matter. Along this path of discovery and innovation, nuclear physics has spurred progress in many intersecting disciplines and technologies. The National Academy of Sciences 2010 Decadal Report on Nuclear Physics clearly articulates the science objectives and long-term priorities for America in a field that has grown increasingly international in scope. This report finds that nuclear physics remains a thriving and vibrant field for while much is now known about how our universe is composed and how matter behaves, even more awaits discovery. Research in nuclear physics is built around very basic questions. How did the universe come to be? How was all the matter in the universe created? I think the innovations and the technical developments that have come out of it have been tremendous for society, but that wasn't the original reason we started to do this. It's the wonder of it all, uh, trying to understand our world. It's very human and really spectacular thing about us is that we wonder about our beginnings. Why am I here? Why is the universe here? What does it all mean? America 
has long been a leader in investment and basic research. Our country has recognized the importance of it and the payoff of it. Today, other countries are rapidly increasing their spending on all kinds of research, including basic research. We see this especially in the field of nuclear physics, where uh, the most capable machines in the world today are, for the first time, not in the United States. If America is to compete in this world that we're entering or that we're finding ourselves in, uh, we're going to have to find a way to have our uh, industrial world, our, our government, and our universities work together much more closely than they have in the past. America can't hope to be first in everything, but we've got to be competitive uh, in the critical fields such as nuclear physics uh, if we're to have an economy. And without an economy, we're not going to solve the problems that this nation faces. The field of nuclear science is well worth nurturing for the discoveries that are now close at hand. In the coming decade, greater accomplishments will come at a faster pace as nuclear physicists, computer scientists, and applied mathematicians integrate state-of-the-art supercomputers into the process of discovery. The interpretation of data from new accelerator facilities and the ability to carry out calculations of great complexity will lead to new understandings of symmetry and reaction dynamics and to new predictions of how matter behaves under extreme conditions. There is much we do not yet know such as how did visible matter come into being? How many more isotopes have yet to be found or to be created? How can we best use the knowledge and technical progress provided by nuclear physics to benefit society? What we do know is this. Scientists in nuclear physics, given the right tools and incentives, will continue to scour the interior of the atom and the vastness of the cosmos until they find answers at the heart of matter. Okay, so that is an, uh, just another aspect of uh, Stuart's career, and one that actually meant a, a lot to me. So if I could just summarize, uh, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed having Stuart as a colleague over my career. He not only added spice, I think he, he taught me a lot. And, uh, and, and of course, I'll, I'll miss him, but I, I, I think that uh, I'm really a better physicist because of it. I think a lot of us feel that way. So, that's all I have to say. Thanks very much.